Hello, and welcome to the next Studiotopia Creative Question Challenge. Studiotopia is a, a residency and a research program that's happening with 13 different uh, artists and scientists collaborative groups across Europe. It's focusing primarily on the sustainable development goals and the challenges that they have uh, shown us, and we are looking at how to deal with those particular challenges. Uh, the residency program runs for 17 months and w it worked in a sort of inverse model, not like how we usually have artists and scientists working together, in the sense that scientists were actually applying to work at artist studios. It only just started. The uh, artists and scientists that will be joining us now have only met uh, two weeks ago. So I would like to introduce them. Our first uh, our artist is Kat Austin. She is, likes to describe herself as an artist and a person. And her research focuses on participatory practices. Uh, Lawrence Gill is a professor in environmental engineering uh, at Trinity College Dublin. And he, his research focuses on airborne and waterborne pollutants. Indre Schlebert is a professor of uh, life science informatics at the University of Helsinki, and her research focuses on data science and uh, paleontology and evolution. So we are facing a climate crisis, among many other crises. Uh, for the last decade or more, we seem to have been just uh, facing an onslaught of various existential, economic, health crises nonstop. Uh, our governments have often like, uh, refused to defer to experts in the sense that expert opinion, informed opinion, scientific opinion are just an on par with their opinion. So what I would like to ask is experts and expertise, uh, who are they and what is an expert? And most importantly, how can we uh, not defer responsibility by just saying we are following the experts, but how can we work with the experts? So I might first cut to Kat Austin, um, if you would like to follow up on this question. Thanks, Andrew. Um, yes, well, as you say, like Studiotopia and my practice are focusing on the sustainable de development goals. And of course, to research and innovate um, and provide solutions that will help us achieve the sustainable development goals, we need expertise from across the board, um, from all disciplines. And that, um, that goes for, you know, what we traditionally think of as an expert, so people who have trained intensively in a particular field. Um, but to achieve the sustainable development goals is also a collective endeavour. And it requires change um, also from everybody. Uh, and in order to find solutions that will work for everybody um, and which can be kind of assimilated by everybody and to find motivations that will move everybody, we need the perspectives of everybody in society, which means that we also need the expertise of people about their own lives and about um, the practices that may not uh, immediately impact on what we think of as uh, solutions for the sustainable development goals. Lawrence, would you like to uh, follow up on that question? Um, yeah, hello everybody. Um, yeah, so I work in environmental engineering, environmental science, and I, the older I get, the more I kind of struggle with the idea of what an expert is in that particular field because you know, from an engineering background, I understand that you can have a highly controlled system, like a, a beam or, or water going through a very defined channel, and, and you can you know, develop real expertise about how that material functions. Um, we can put equations around it, et cetera, and make predictions. But then once you start to get into the, the wider environment, you know, if we're looking at the, the climate or at big catchments, the, all of these, these these assumptions about how material works and you know there's so many different things going on there's microorganisms you know there's different chemicals and and the more i research the more it makes me realize how how little i actually understand or how much more there is to understand how so almost ill-informed i am uh, 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 as a sense so i i find it this this concept of being an expert in a certain area you know what, Often it means that you, you understand what there is more to know and what you don't know, I, I think. 
And then, you know, once we broaden these questions out to sustainable development goals type topic, as Kat said, I mean, we, 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 it's not just, um, you know, we're talking about climate, it's not just the, the, the chemistry, etc. cetera. We're, we're dealing with people's society, people's actions, and, we, and you throw that into the mix with all this other chaos that's going on in the natural world. Um, um, it's very, very difficult to make predictions. And so I, I feel, um, we, yeah, everybody has a, a, has a valid opinion um, on this. And I mean, just as an example, quite often I work with farmers, for example, who are in agriculture looking at contaminants, and they often know much better than what I come with my fancy ideas. What's, you know, it's just totally obvious to them what I um, say to them because they've been working there their, their whole life. So, you know, and it's very valuable um, information if we're trying to take the science uh, forward to try to come up with solutions, for example. So, yeah, I think I'll leave it at that. <laughs> In, in, Indre, uh, how, how would you answer this? Um, thanks. Uh, yeah. So uh, from from the animal world perspective, I was I was just thinking while uh, while while my colleagues were answering. From the animal world perspective, we can uh, think of specialists and generalists. So um, if I think if we think of an expert, we usually think of a specialist very very sort of deeply and. Uh, narrowly uh, investigate who, who deeply and narrowly investigated a specific topic, um, but we also we also need generalists in a, in a sense who can uh, sort of make links and connections from 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 topic to topic. Um, so those those would also put the pieces of of, of the puzzle uh, together. So. Um, yeah, so so both uh, highly specialized people and and uh, highly uh, generalized and versatile versatile people are needed, and those who can translate from one one area of expertise, one specialization specialization to to the other, um, are crucial. I think. Uh, following up on that, this this notion of translation um, of kind of. Uh, the the knowledge of the expert or the specialist in this sense uh, how can sort of how can we as does the artist perform a role in in translating um, and also uh, in in the sense what Lawrence was saying as well when you know he's speaking with farmers that have a very particular and special knowledge that that is is not sort of uh, like they're connecting with the with the with the normal natural sciences or uh, um, hard sciences. How how do we get that connection, that translation between the farmers, to the scientists, to the policy makers, uh, to the public, uh, and and does art uh, perform a role in this? Um, and and on the topic of uh, to both you, Lawrence and Indre, are now starting a collaboration with an artist. Is this something that you see as the as a role, perhaps, of, of this residency program to translate expertise um, and uh, non expertise, uh, which would be is, a, is is really just another type of expertise? Mm -hmm. uh, I might start with Kat on this. Okay, thanks, Andrew. Nice tricky question. Um, I. I mean, I would say I wouldn't like to generalize about um, what art doesn't doesn't do too much, but I would say that um, you know I have I've made an artwork that tries to translate the experience of uh, a non-human coral um, to humans so that it's human understandable. Um, uh, to engender empathy with coral in human beings, right? So, I mean, translation, I think, can be, yeah, I think, you know, it's a fo form of communication. And um, I, as an artist and other artists I know, without wanting to generalize, do indeed um, affect this kind of, um, do affect this kind of translational communication through their work, because they're creating work in a communicative media um but i wouldn't say that the outset is necessarily always to to translate or make understandable um or to be illustrative of other forms of knowledge but rather to um work with different forms of research artistic research to try to create 
a different kind of understanding. So I think that the the real value of um, collaborations across disciplines is that people bring together their different perspectives and different methods and can hopefully achieve something that would not have been achieved by just the summation of them working uh, independently. Um, and I suppose, yes, I would say that, you know, um, on the broad scheme of things, artists will, uh, will generally be working across knowledge hierarchies um, and working with traditional knowledges as well as um, embodied knowledge and bringing in uh, knowledge from experts on all of these fields, including knowledge from scientific expertise, helps to create like a rich tapestry. And in, in, in that way, um, an artist can, but does not always act as a bit of a, um, a kind of uh, interactional expert in, in bringing together and synthesizing all of these things to create something new. Um, yeah. So, uh, with, with knowledge hierarchies, um, this, this, when you, as a scientist, you're working very much towards uh, communicating to your peers. Uh, that, that is the sort of, is this, would you describe this as the main sort of role with your, with your research and your research papers, is to kind of communicate and share knowledge to your peers and to build that in this certain area? And uh, like, uh, or do you also feel that's very important uh, for the scientists to also work on communicating, uh, like, this sort of difference uh, idea of not necessarily knowledge, um, but an idea of an understanding to the broader public, uh, Lawrence? Um, yeah. So I mean, I, I think traditionally um, it has been the case that a lot of academic um, endeavours, you know, you're, you're trying to mainly, well, maybe more in the sciences, uh, you're, you're trying to uh, relate your ideas to other academics. Um, but, I, you know, I work, work very much in an applied field, you know, environmental engineering, um, and there's an increasing, so inherently, a lot of what we do is coming up with solutions, so you're interacting with the public, etc. you know, working on those types of projects. It's not just pure science, as, as it were. But then equally, um, there's, been a, there's been a big shift, um, I think, recently uh, for everybody in the university in terms of making the public understand uh, public perception and understanding is the, the term that is now used, um, what, what, what it is we do and what, why it's of value uh, to the society. So I work for a, a, a pan-university um, geoscience uh, uh, um, centre called ICRAG in Ireland, and there's a, a big section now called Public Perception and Understanding who specialise in these forms of communication and trying to get us in our little ivory towers to, to come out and try to explain what it is we do um, to, to from school children up to, you know, uh, uh, ad adults, the general public, um, and w why is it important? And, and, and there's various variety of different ways of communicating this. I think art is, is, is one uh, method. I mean, I don't think art has to do that, but I, I think it can be a very valid form. Um, I mean, w one thing that was strikes me when I give my lectures is, um, say, music, uh, you can hear a tune from when you were uh, um, I don't know, eight years old or something, and immediately the words come back to you um, if you haven't heard it for 20 or 30 years. Whereas the words I say in lectures, I'm sure 10 minutes after I've spoken them, don't come back to students. So somehow that touches some other part of your imagination. And if you could somehow, somehow wrap these ideas, these more com sort of complex scientific ideas, um, in, in, some, in something that touches the other part of your, 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 your brain um, to make it more accessible to people, that would be an interesting uh, concept. So. So I can just try to sing my lectures, maybe. <laughs> I mean, smells, that's another thing. You know, you get these very evocative smells come back uh, later, and somehow that, you know, it, it takes you straight back to a uh, place. Um, so I always thought that, that was an interesting uh, concept, I'm trying to get, communicate what it is we, we, we do. And, Indra, you work with large data sets, um, like going back thousands of years as well. Um, uh, how, how do you kind of like translate uh, this sort of information? Is it a method of tr a translation or is it just a, 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 a process of kind of um, collecting uh, and, and uh, 
just curating, is, is <laughs> using an artistic mm -hmm. term in this sense, um, or is are you actively involved? And when you're using sort of uh, like natural language processing or any sort of AI systems in that that way, is that uh, is that acting as a form of translation of of this type of uh, information or knowledge? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, yeah. In a way, in in a way, it, it does. So we actually, we actually look for patterns and try to understand processes of how the world works, uh, and how the world works today by also looking at how it how it was in the past and what we can infer from the record. And so the translation aspect is uh, is there during the. Uh, the analysis, the computational, uh, met applying computational methods or developing computational methods themselves. But even more so is the aspect of, of uh, uh, communicating it uh, also to the public, as, as my uh, colleagues also mentioned, uh, not, to, not to, to limit ourselves to, to our scientific peers, but uh, to go back to the public and, and explain to them. And their uh, translation matters because we somehow we somehow have to make it personal. Uh, we have to we need to tell a story in a way that people can relate themselves to to that story. And sometimes we need to make make that story personal and uh, sort of uh, bring it closer to the people, closer to the general public. And that's where I think I think uh, or I hope. Uh, art can uh, can can play a, a big role as well. So I think I think the important part is in in this expertise and translation business is to make people uh, not indifferent. So when I think back, for example, now at the uh, at the pandemic at, at COVID situation, and compare it in my mind to uh, to climate actions that were going on during this winter, and. Uh, yeah, climate actions. People were uh, sort of watching TV, looking at uh, at at, uh, at the uh, protests, but general public were not not really not that much uh, involved. But when when the pandemic happened, immediately it was personal. It 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 was felt that it can hurt everybody, and the actions happened immediately. Flights stopped, and isolations happened, and just instantaneously. Uh, reaction. So I think, I think, personalization and making people not indifferent matters. And then uh, whether people agree or disagree, whether they hate or like the message, that's that's important. But that's a secondary question. Um, being neutral or indifferent is is sort of the worst situation. Uh, so I think I think that we can uh, we can sort of provoke people to have opinions or to form their opinions in uh, art and science collaboration. I hope we can do that. Yeah, I mean, this, this, is, this is why I've kind of been uh, like discussing this sort of expertise uh, and to this idea of communicating expertise uh, and, and, and uh, this idea of translation is that, you know, we have had, uh, we, we have had, we are in this climate crisis right now. And there's, there's uh, what we happened with the, with the COVID, as you just said, is that at the very, very beginning of COVID, there was that personal uh, feeling, there was this urgency, there was this togetherness also. There was very much uh, this community sense that we're in this together, this is a crisis, we need to react to it. And this, uh, this kind of seemed to have like dissipated after a little while. Um, and, and it's sort of... Uh, you know the beginnings where everyone's like on the street applauding each other and the health workers and um, how do we sustain? How do we sustain the sense of urgency? Uh, it's the, the 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 climate crisis. There's been moments like in in sort of public discourse, like with the Fridays for Future. There was there was the sense of urgency, and then it kind of like drifted off again. And it's, I, don't, I don't think it's not necessarily that, the, that there's no personalization. I, I think it's like, how do we embed or Im, uh, embed an embodied understanding, an embodied urgency of this crisis? And, 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 and how do we sustain, how can we sustain the sense of urgency? Uh, Kat? Yeah, I think this is, I mean, this is the sort of crucial crux of it right and it's I don't know that I have an answer but I would say that 
Um, this is what I've been striving for with my work over many years now, um, is to, to understand how we can convey um, in an emotion, like a, a deep felt, long standing emotional way, this, um, this crisis that we're in with the climate. Um, and but as you say, as we've seen with COVID, even something that's much more um, kind of tangible to us or uh, much more close to us in terms of time and space uh, in, in the West, like, it, it, it becomes normalized very, very quickly. Humans are wonderfully adaptive. You know, we, we face adversity and we manage to normalize it and carry on. And, you know, um, I think the, the thing is with, of course, the climate crisis is that I don't think that we um, have the time to adapt that we're going to need before a lot of suffering. Um, and so, as I say, I don't think I have an answer, but what I've been trying to do is to convey um, some of the kind of felt uh, and felt aspects and the reality of the climate crisis through my work through using sound um, and uh, installations that kind of essentially work on work on the emotions to really try to convey this kind of uh, dreadful urgency that we have um, but the challenge of maintaining that urgency I think has to be tempered you know if we're thinking systemically has to be tempered also with achievable changes that people can make to their lives and that's that's a, a quite other um, quite other challenge when it comes to maintaining urgency I suppose the only uh, light on the horizon is the fact that many, many people are continuing to work and create work all the time that addresses this question. Um, and so the amount of attention that is given to it continues to increase. So, and that's, you know, not just across the arts and sciences, but also people protesting, also people coming up with entrepreneurial um, ideas, uh, also the media covering it, you know, that we, we are increasing the dialogue and, and we see that whenever there's a really important report, like the IPCC report for 2018, it creates more impetus again and again and again. And I think that it's such a hard problem that we feel so removed from that we do need all of these kind of um, informational devices, but we also critically need um, art that addresses the problem in, and it incorporates all the complexity that we get from multiple scientists perspectives and multiple uh, perspectives from other disciplines and create something that really creates a movement inside people um, because that's really the the thing that you cannot ignore is your emotions. Lawrence would, would you like to follow up on that? Yeah I mean in terms of your, your original question how can we um, maintain the the urgency uh, I mean, personally, I, I don't think we can unless there's um, personal impact on people. I mean, that, that's what it seems to drive a lot of people's actions. I'm not saying that's ideal, but um, as we've seen in the COVID, you know, people are becoming a bit sort of blasé and starting to question some of the, the, the restrictions because the majority of people, well, certainly here in Ireland, aren't actually dying of, of, of COVID. I mean, that, that's that's the reality of it, and I don't really know anybody who, who is. So... Um, that unless there's a continued personal impact, and the same with the climate. In, 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 um, I mean, I, I study a lot, a lot of aspects of climate change, like hydrology, etc. And there, there are changes going on. I, I know that, but these things don't impact on us uh, that that significantly day to day. So, whilst you know we are, we like to think of ourselves as an intelligent species, and we can sort of plan ahead and all this. Um, most people day to day are working, as Cadoff said, off off just. Uh, emotions and you know we're all busy running around doing our, our things and unless something jumps out in front of you it, it doesn't it doesn't retain that sense of um, urgency so I, I think in terms of the climate crisis I mean it is it, it's gonna have to be down to uh, organizations people who, who are used to taking long or, or, or are paid to take longer-term decisions like 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 uh, governments who can be much more strategic um, 
or things like the IPCC, more kind of global organizations. And by just, just con continually reminding people that this is, this is coming. And I mean, I, I think things are changing pretty quickly, actually, uh, for just the, the normal people in terms of the perception of climate change. So I think it is eventually, it is starting to have an impact on, on, more sp on society more at large, but it is from this continual effort and just continually reporting the, the figures, highlighting it in, in news programs, um, etc. I mean, on the flip side, something as a hydrologist that sometimes annoys me is the way, that, and, and it is to do with kind of short-term perceptions, is that often every time there's a big rainstorm, you know, it's attributed to, to climate change. So and and that's, that's also isn't, I mean, it reminds people of climate change, but you know, statistically and all this, that, that, that may not be uh, the case. You know, weather is fairly random um, and we do have big events uh, um, throughout, uh, throughout history, re re uh, recent history. But that being said, although it annoys me as a scientist, I, I, yeah, I think, well, you know, maybe this is a good thing because it's constantly reminding people that the climate is changing. We are going to get more intense rainstorms. Um, etc. Like that particular rainstorm may, may just have just been a fairly normal rainstorm we, that we get this year, but at the same time, it's keep, keeping it, uh, bringing it back into the front of people's heads, into their perception, and um, and then it goes back to you know I know day to day troubles um, come into people's heads, but it's it's there somewhere and it keeps getting brought back to the front, and hopefully it will um, people start to change their their actions, and if people start to change their actions and opinions, that will change governments because. We, we vote in the governments and then, you know, the whole thing gets cycles round, doesn't it? And we should get faster and faster movement, I think. And, and Indre, we're just, we're running short of, of time, but like, can you also sort of uh, give a perspective on, on sustaining urgency? Uh, you work in paleontology across like time frames that are like beyond conception for most people. Yeah. And uh, so, so uh, I'm thinking, I'm thinking of, of the long run. And when you ask, ask how you sustain the urgency, well, immediate uh, businesses came to my mind. So how businesses, should we think how businesses sustain urgency? And there are two types, basically, those that uh, keep sustaining, like sort of keep inventing new and new urgency again and again and discarding uh, sort of something that may be not necessarily outdated. But there are also long-run perspectives, like we hear of companies in Japan running thousands of years, where reputation matters and the long run matters. So I'm, I'm, I'm even thinking, should we even sustain urgency, or should we sort of go for the long run, which is maybe not urgency first, but reputation and long run and sort of um, consistency? So consistency uh, 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 over urgency. Um, so we're running short of time, and we've got uh, about a few seconds left. But I'd like to just hear from each of you uh, just kind of one question that's kind of come up in your mind over this discussion. Is that, that is the question that we, we should be asking. And the, it's the question that you guys can be asking each other in this residency over the next 17 months. So Kat, just one question. Uh, how do we create a new, better way of being? Lawrence? Um, one question? How, how, how can we change, uh, uh, how can we nudge society um, towards achieving sustainable development goals? Indre, it's a rush, I know, but... Where do we go from here? And yeah, where do we go from here? So thank you, everyone. Uh, this is the Studiotopia program, and it will be going on for the next two years. Thank you. Thank you.